Good morning. How are you today? Thank you for joining me on this program. Today we're turning to Mark chapter 11 and the opening verses. And here we find Jesus going from Jericho to Jerusalem. By the way, if ever you're in Israel, you'll find that you take this route. The road is new. It's not the one Jesus traveled on exactly. And they've even put in a new sort of bypass. But you come from Jericho to Jerusalem through Bethany. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Let's read the opening verses. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you're doing this, tell him the Lord needs it, and he will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. They untied it. Some people standing there said, What are you doing untying the colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. Bethany is only about two miles from Jerusalem, just a little bit closer than that. And coming into Bethany, they had had a tremendous climb from Jerusalem. To do it in a bus is one thing, to do it on foot is another. And it must have been a very, very heavy walk that they would had. Now as they're approaching the village of Bethany, Jesus tells them to go ahead, two of them, and to get this colt. I was always a little confused about this as a boy, how on earth this all worked out. I really believe Jesus had prearranged this. I can't prove it to you. I think that on some occasion when he was in Bethany, he made these arrangements. I think he told them that he was coming into the city, and could he use a cult, and they agreed, and so on and so forth. And this is how it all worked out. But notice that when the disciples got there, everything was ready, just as Jesus had said. They untied the cult and brought the cult to Jesus. One other little detail here is interesting, and you'll find it in the other Gospels too. The cult had never been sat upon, and that was important. And so they bring the cult to Jesus. Now notice what happens next. <clears throat> this is important. Verse 7. When they brought the colt to Jesus, they threw cloaks over it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches that have been cut from the fields or from the palm trees. And those who went ahead, and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! And then they shouted two other things, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest! Now, the possibility is that they thought Jesus was going to be a prince on earth, a king on earth, to set them free from the yoke of Rome, to get rid of the Romans once and for all. But there's something special here. Jesus is on a colt, which is a sign of peace, and not on a horse. If he'd come on a horse, it was a sign of war, but Jesus didn't. He came on that cult of peace. We were in Jerusalem for Palm Sunday. It was very fascinating. I don't think we got nearly as involved as we should have done. We were there in 79, and it wasn't totally safe. There were times when there were bombs going off, and so we didn't get into the procession. At least some of us didn't. Unfortunately, we listened to our guide rather than to our heads. <clears throat> but one of our men actually got into the procession. And interestingly enough, it now comes up over the Mount of Olives and weaves its way down and into the city. We saw it from the city. It was a wonderful sight. Hundreds and thousands of people from all over the world now join in that very special procession. Rather different from the first time it took place. But they still carry palms and they sing as they go in different languages, but all singing to the Lord our God in their own way. Now, in the case of Jesus, it must have been a very fascinating sight. Here is Jesus coming into his own city. And the people are shouting, Hosanna, save! And I don't think they knew what they were calling out. Blessed be the son of David. I don't think they really understood what they were shouting. They were quoting from the book of Isaiah. But there's so much more in it than that. 
the only reason Jesus was going into Jerusalem was to save, to go to that cross to save mankind, and as we saw the other day, to give his life a ransom for many. It was such a special occasion, and the people were excited, and they saw him at that point as a leader, as a king. They laid their cloaks so that he could ride over it. They put palms on the way so that he could ride over them. A very special occasion for our Lord. And so he heads into Jerusalem. And then it says <coughs> in verse 11, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany and with the twelve. I wonder if you've ever been there. The area of the temple is very, very large. I don't think, unless you see it, you can even imagine. Just outside Jerusalem, there's a hotel, and a man has made a model of the old city. And it begins to give you some idea of the proportion of the size of the temple compared with the rest of old Jerusalem. It took up a big proportion, maybe as much as a quarter of the city. And Jesus goes right to the temple, <coughs> which wasn't far from the entrance from the Mount of Olives, and looks all round. But it's getting late in the day. He didn't do any more. He then goes back to Bethany with the twelve, and no doubt they took the cult back. Where did they go? I think we can be absolutely certain. They went to the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. That's where Jesus stayed when he was at Jerusalem. He'd take that little journey of just under two miles. Remember, he walked all the time. Went back there and stayed overnight. Why did he go there? I think because they were friends. I think it was a little haven of rest. A place he could go and be alone. A place where he was loved. Do you realize this? Jesus in his earthly condition, Jesus in a human being, needed love like you do. The worst thing for any human being is to feel unloved and unwanted. These people loved Jesus. And in the situations into which he was just going, he needed Mary, Martha and Lazarus as he'd never needed them before. And so he stayed at Bethany with the twelve. You see, so often in the Bible, there's just a little sentence, which on first sight doesn't seem to say much. But when you begin to read between the lines, and when you really realize what was happening, it was very vital. We all need that haven of rest. We need that place where we can go and be loved. And if you're someone listening to my voice and you're a single person, a widow, you've been left by your husband, there are times when you need to be loved. And if you don't have any human affection, just ask the Lord if you can curl up on his lap and be loved. You need the love of a heavenly father. You need the love of the one who gave his life for you. And he's longing to love you. Why did Jesus look round the temple? Well, I think it was a preparation for the next day. But he was seeing what was going on. He was looking at the people. He was looking at the priests. And can you imagine the stir amongst the leadership? They were afraid of him as it was. They were also jealous of him. He had attracted the people's attention. The people were going after him. They weren't having much to do with the leadership. You can imagine how mad they were. When he taught, the Bible says, he taught with authority, not as the scribes. So the people naturally gathered to listen to Jesus. And if Jesus starts teaching in the temple, the temple leaders knew immediately that the people would go after him. And they wouldn't be listening to them. That does cause jealousy. And you'll see this even in the church today. Certain preachers attract a big crowd, and other preachers can't handle that. It was just as true in Jesus' day. And so Jesus just leaves the city late that night and goes back to Bethany and rests. Because there's a big day tomorrow, and Jesus understands that. Let's look at the next verse, verse 12. It says, The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree, in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached out, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. 
Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat the fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. You know, it would be rather interesting if you just went aside and found out what this meant. Why did this fig tree wither? Why did Jesus do such a thing to it? And we're going to look at that tomorrow morning. It's rather a fascinating situation and totally different from anything else. But on that first Palm Sunday, there was such a joy and such a crowd and so many hosannas. It's amazing to think that within the week, they'd be shouting, crucify him. What am I saying? <clears throat> Crowds are very fickle and you have to know that. One minute they can shout for you and the next minute they can shout against you. And the sad thing with crowds are that they can so easily be stirred up. We see it sometimes, don't we? Maybe the trade union has a meeting and one speaker can stir them up. Or there's a political rally and one speaker can stir them up. It wasn't any different in Jesus' day. On Palm Sunday, there were cheers for him. On Good Friday, there were cheers against him. And what I'm afraid of is that there were sometimes the same people in that crowd on both occasions. The people who turn up for everything. The people who never really think a thing through. The people who don't know what's going on, but they shout anyway. Crowds are terribly dangerous. They're swayed by emotions for and against. And if a person knows how to do it, they can sway the emotions very easily in the crowd. That was a great day for Jesus, but it didn't last. It was a great day for those people because they were really cheering the King of Kings, and I don't think they knew it. But on that Palm Sunday, he entered Jerusalem as a victor. And the disciples must have been thrilled. But the Jewish leaders were horrified at what was going to happen next. And the next day it did happen. And we'll look at that together.